My name is Shelley Dean, and I'm one of the speech and language pathologists with the school board. My part of the presentation is going to be talking a little bit about this book. It's called Oral Language at Your Fingertips. Every school should have this book, at least one copy. It's also available in French. Um, it was published by the Ontario Association of Speech and Language Pathologists and Audiologists. So we're going to use this as sort of a framework for today for discussing oral language. Okay, we're going to start off with finger number one. And there should be handouts, I think, at your table of the hand. Finger number one is about phonological awareness and phonemic awareness and what the difference is. I'm not going to talk about this too, too much. Uh, because Dr. Cronwell is going to talk about this a little bit later, and I think everyone has a, a pretty good working knowledge of this. Uh, phonological awareness is the ability to reflect on, manipulate parts of words, so sounds, syllables, rhymes, onsets. Phonemic awareness is getting down to the smaller unit, so the individual sounds of words. There are many different phonological awareness tasks. We should all be aware of these. Blending, isolating, segmenting, deleting, and substituting. These can all be done either at the syllable level or at the sound level. Okay, phonological awareness is not the same as phonics. Phonics is an instructional strategy, and when we're working on phonics, we're looking at letter-sound relationships. Okay, if you think in terms of development, phonological awareness, you're going to move sort of from the big units to the smaller units. So first students have to have an awareness at the word level, then a little bit smaller at the sound syllable level, then onset rhymes, and then down to the phonemic level. Uh, there's many, many, many different phonological awareness activities that you can do in your classroom, um, but they should be fun, they should be motivating, they should be engaging. Um, and a word about um, our ESL partners at home. Uh, just because parents don't speak English doesn't mean that they can't practice phonological awareness activities with their children. Uh, we do know that language, <clears throat> in terms of being able to transfer what they learn in their home language or L1, transfers directly into English. So that also has implications for our French immersion programs as well. Okay, there are some cultural linguistic differences. Uh, as I said, phonological awareness does transfer from one language to another. Blending is blending, segmenting is segmenting. It doesn't matter what language. You can even do it with nonsense words. Um, but please be aware that if your student comes from a home where English is not the first language, there are sounds in English that don't occur in the home language, and also the opposite is true. Okay, so we'll use an example. I'm glad to see that, that Begley is here. <laughs> we have a lot of Arabic-speaking students in our system now, um, and there are different uh, sounds in Arabic than there are in English. I won't even try to say some of the Arabic sounds because they're so difficult, but if it's difficult for me to say their sounds, it's really difficult for some of those younger students to say some of our English sounds. So some of the differences are the T's and the D's. That's produced very differently in Arabic than it is in English. In English, we kind of use a tongue-tip elevation position, to say our t and our d. Um, in Arabic, they use more the root of the tongue to say those. So those sounds sound a little bit different in Arabic than they do in English. Um, also, the R in Arabic is a little bit different. If it's post-vocalic, that means after the R, um, it's trilled, or kind of a rolled R. If it's pre-vocalic, it's not trilled. So that might, your students might have difficulty hearing the R sound in Arabic. And in some dialects of Arabic, there's no p, v, or ing. So again, that may have some implications for some of our students. Okay, some other examples. We have a lot of students that speak uh, some of the Asian languages at home. We have a lot of students that speak Cantonese. Did you know that in Cantonese, uh, all words are monosyllabic? So if you're trying to do a syllabication activity with those students, it might be kind of hard for them. Um, they don't, also don't have consonant clusters, so they may have trouble hearing consonant clusters. Um, and only six phonemes are, occur at the end of the word. So all words end in one of those six sounds. And then there's several English sounds that are not found in Cantonese at all. So this is gonna have some implications for some reading, some writing. If you have more questions about uh, ELL, so English language learners, ESL, English as a second language, or CLD, culturally and linguistic diversity, um, please talk to your school speech and language pathologist. We have access to a number of charts for different languages because um, there may be some differences. Okay.
That's finger number one. On to finger number two is vocabulary. Okay, what is vocabulary? That's knowledge about words, knowing the meanings of words. And what we want to do is increase the size and richness of our students' vocabulary. Okay, here's an if then for everyone. So if we increase the size and richness of our students' vocabulary, then students are better able to understand what's being said to them and they're better able to communicate their thoughts and ideas to other people. So that occurs both orally and in reading and writing. So vocabulary is really important. You need to have the words. Okay, what about reading? We do know that students with strong vocabularies are better able to access word meaning quickly. And the key there is quickly, when they're reading and listening. Um, anybody who's tried to learn a second language knows how difficult it is if you have to look up every other word to figure out what the meaning of it is it really makes it very difficult to understand what you're reading. Okay, how do we do that? Lots and lots of experiences. So this is an example of the word cottage. So students would need to hear that word cottage many, many times in many different contexts to really understand what the word cottage means. Okay, how does vocabulary develop? First, we start with no knowledge. So those young children on the left have no knowledge about swimming. Then you develop a surface knowledge so we have the children that are kind of floating on the surface, and then later on we develop a deep knowledge. That is the general sequence for all vocabulary acquisition. Okay, so here's an example from my friends at Northwood. What is a stander? Most people in this room would not know what a stander is, um, but Northwood, I'm sure, does. Okay, so I'll give you some examples, because we talked about how the importance of multiple experiences. Leslie got a new stander. Can you bring the standard in the classroom? Make sure the label standards are, are correct on the standard. Is that helping you? Some more examples. Send the standard to Mrs. Katevsky. She doesn't like the standard. Did you lock the standard? Can you move the shelf for the standard? Is that helping? You've had more examples. We need to use the standard for 30 minutes. The standard takes up a lot of room. The standard's cumbersome. Is that helping? Make sure the standard is secure. She looks good in the standard today. <laughs> okay, here's what a standard is. So what I've provided you with is, a, is, a, is an adult-friendly definition. So just the examples of hearing the word by itself was not helpful. We needed to provide some explicit instruction or explaining what that word meant. So a standard, it's an assistive technology. It's used by a person who has difficulty with mobility, and it's a standing frame. Feel like you'll know a little bit more about it? Okay, let's make it a little more explicit, and we'll make it visual. There's different kinds of standers. There's stationary ones, there's mobile ones. There's some benefits. Stationary one doesn't move. The mobile one can be self-propelled. So now we've organized the information to help you understand what that vocabulary is. So now let's make it visual. That's what it looks like. So here's some samples. So now do you feel like you have a surface knowledge of what a stander is? Okay. We can deepen your knowledge even further. We can have a discussion about standards. Maybe you would like to visit Northwood and see one of them in action. Uh, you might see it in a regular ed classroom. You might see it in a special ed classroom. Maybe you want to look on YouTube, watch a video. Or maybe you want to have an in-service from a physiotherapist from John McGivney. So now we're linking some of your prior knowledge to new knowledge. Okay, how does the vocabulary develop? Well, it should develop very, very quickly. <clears throat> Preschoolers should be learning at least nine words a day, which is really very rapid when you think about it. School agers, it's even more rapid, 20 words a day. Okay, we also know that older children who are regular readers are constantly building vocabulary. And this little guy, he likes comics and Spider-Man. So he's reading. Again, how do you teach ro ro vocabulary? Lots of rich vocabulary experiences and explicit instruction. Okay? Especially from our students from impoverished backgrounds. They don't hear as many words before they come to school. Okay? What about our culturally and linguistically diverse student? What about our English language learner? What about our French immersion student? Same thing. You move from no knowledge to surface knowledge to deep knowledge. 
So for the English only students, that's the student who speaks English at home, you want strong L1, which would be English, to support ongoing development of L1, which would be English. For our ELL or CLD, strong first language, it might be Arabic, might be Urdu, might be Spanish, you want that strong L1 to support development of L2, and at school that's English. French immersion is a little bit different. L1 is often English, but not necessarily, and it's going to support development of L2, and in this case, L2 would be French. Okay, what does the research show? If a student understands a word in their first language, then learning the second learning the word in their second language will occur faster. So that's why we want children to have those rich vocabulary experiences at home, to come to school with a well-developed Arabic or Urdu. Okay? What words do you teach? Well, you want to focus on words that are cognitively and developmentally appropriate. Um, you don't want words that are too advanced, but you don't want words that are too easy either. Think about Vygotsky and the zone of proximal development. You want to be right at their level. You also want to make sure that you use words that are precise. You want words that can be used across different contexts and across different instructional strategies. Okay? So, so for example, some instructional vocabularies might be a word like underline, compare, define. Um, an example of the word underline, uh, this is a, an item that occurs in some of our speech language tests. Um, and there's a picture of a toy and there's a line on one side, on the other side, above, below, around. And the directive is point to the toy that is underlined. And a student who does not have that vocabulary might point to the toy that is under the line. Okay, concept vocabulary is very poor, uh, powerful too. Size, location, time, sequence, quantity. All of those things tie into math. So you really want to be focusing on those words in authentic interactions uh, in the classroom. So there's some, some concept words. And you can see how some of those would tie into math. The time sequence words, those are going to tie into your procedural writing. OK, how is my student doing? OK, have a look. How do they understand? Do they understand and use a variety of vocabulary? So not just nouns and verbs. Uh, do they understand those concept words that were on that previous slide? Do they understand the curricular vocabulary? Can they use categories, synonyms, antonyms? And understanding and using humor. Humor is a big red flag if you have students that have trouble understanding humor, that there might be a language problem there. Okay, how do you expand their vocabulary? Lots and lots and lots of methods. Okay, so again, providing a friendly definition. So that's what we did with the word standard. You got a very friendly definition for that. Um, sometimes dictionary definitions are very difficult for students to understand, so that's why we would ask you to provide a student-friendly definition. Um, engaging the students in discussions about words, making connections, and providing lots and lots of familiar examples that they can relate to. Okay, concept words, we talked a little bit about that already. You know, can they compare and contrast? That's very important. How do you teach con uh, concept words? Usually you teach them as contrast of pairs. So you teach big with small, tall with short, not big with long. That would be very confusing. And lots and lots of review, so not once. Many, many opportunities. Okay, dialogic reading. Um, it is exactly what it says, where you're engaging the student in a dialogue as you're reading about a book. There should be nice, rich conversation happening. Lots of WH questions that are, you know, with prompts and cues to extend the conversation. And repeated readings, that's another powerful thing. That's where you're rereading the same book over several opportunities, uh, not just one time. Okay, semantic mapping. This is making things explicit, making things visual. So you're organizing the information to the, for the student. So pictures, words, Venga, diagrams. Okay, key points to remember. Lots of opportunities. Students require lots of opportunities for rich discussion. And you also want to teach words within context and then expand it as quickly as you can to other contexts. Being selective about what words you teach and focusing on a handful of words at a time. So it's not a word a day or a concept a day. You want to focus on several words over a period of time, and once those students have mastered those, then start adding more words. And always trying to link new vocabulary to prior knowledge. Okay, so this is an example from uh, an ESL teacher, Eric Wydeen at Northwood. And what he had asked his students to do was to go around and take pictures of things that they didn't know 
the names for. And it was interesting. Some of the things you could see very clearly that they wouldn't know what it was. But then there was more obvious things that you would think that they would know. Um, it doesn't show on here, but one of the items was a doorknob. He didn't, the student didn't know the, the name of a doorknob. And yet, use the doorknob every day. He would say, open the door every day. Uh, but you know, had the teacher or anybody else taken the time to explicitly label that as a doorknob? Um, and then there's another interesting one here where, see the fingers? He's pointing to the wrinkle or the fold in the page. What do you call that? So being very, very precise again with your vocabulary. Okay, take nothing for granted. Um, another story from an ESL classroom. This is from Shannon MacArthur. She had a, a group of boys who are learning English. They're doing very, very well. Orally, they speak quite well. They're also beginning writers. And she had read them a story in a guided reading activity. She'd done all the pre-teaching of the vocabulary. The story was um, about Daisy the dog. And she had pre-taught vocabulary like woods and path, and the boy and the dog get lost in the woods. And then the dog, he tells the dog to take him home, so Daisy takes him home. So she asked the students afterwards what the story was about, and they said that they understood it. And then she started asking them about, what does lost mean? And she got the blank look. So the students really didn't understand what lost meant. Um, so she asked again, she prompted again, well, what does lost mean? And the one boy said, I know, I know. It means lots and lots of money. So the word lost and lots were so similar sounding that he didn't understand the difference. And so the whole story, he lost the meaning of the story. So that was difficult. And very strong teacher, but even she got fooled because he was so good orally, she assumed that he understood. Okay, let's move on to the next finger, word and sentence structure. Here's a familiar book, The Rainbow Fish. This is page one from Rainbow Fish. So have a look at that um, in terms of word structure and sentence structure. And this is a pretty common book that would be read in a kindergarten program or in early years, grade one. And you can look at the level of difficulty of the vocabulary, look at the complexity of the sentence structure. Okay, what is a word? Words are made up of individual sounds, those are the phonemes, but the smallest unit of meaning in a word is called a morpheme. So book is one morpheme, books, there's a plural there. So that's two morphemes. We want our students to be able to understand that by adding those little word endings, and those affixes completely changes the meaning of a word. So if students have trouble with that, they're going to have trouble with comprehension, both orally and when reading. If you look at sentences, sentences are made up of individual words. We have simple sentences, we have complex sentences, and sentences should convey a complete thought. And students need to be able to understand what appropriate structure of a sentence should look like. Okay, so here's some morphemes. So scales, just shout out if you know how many morphemes that is. Two, yeah, swimming, two, so the swim and the ing. Anything, two, with any and thing, so the ing is not the same as the ing above. Turned, two, with the ed. Water, one, but is different from teacher, which is, because that er is different, yeah. Darkness, two, disappeared, Three, yeah. Playfully, three. Loneliest, three, yeah, lone, or alone, Lee, L-Y, and est. Okay, so again, look at this one. Just, if you wanna just talk at your table for a minute in terms of looking at the, the text structure here. What do you notice in terms of individual words? Notice the concept words, so look for the concept words that are size, location, quantity, number, time sequence, and then think about the developmental level of the student that you're thinking of, and then also look at the sentence structure. Simple sentences are subject, verb, verb objects. Complex, a little bit different. In terms of concept words, the first concept word in that is long, then out, then in, then deep, most, 
in, every, among. Those are pretty high level vocabulary words. And yet we would expect a lot of our kindergarten students to learn that. So that's, they would be learning this in context. So they would be hearing these words here, but then they're gonna hear them again in another way. Okay, what do you think about word endings? Affixes. There's not too, too many in here. I see an ED. I see a full. I see some plurals. Okay. Uh, sentence structure. It's kind of complex. Okay, how do you teach word structure and sentence structure? Authentic interactions. So there's some very specific techniques. I'm going to give you a quick example for each one of these, but I would encourage you to look at the book, Oral Language at Your Fingertips, to develop your knowledge a little bit further. So what does extending and expanding look like? Okay, that would be the student makes a grammatical error. The teacher's going to correct it and emphasize the correct grammatical. So this is a child that say him for he. Him has pretty scales. You would say, oh yes, he does have pretty scales. So you've just corrected it. But there's no requirement for the student to imitate or to repeat the model. Recasting, again, the student makes the error. Teacher's going to correct the error and then make it into a new sentence type. So him wouldn't play with the other fish. Oh, he wouldn't play with the other fish. Why won't he play with the other fish? So again, it's very natural. It's within context. Vertical structuring is a little more sophisticated. Again, the student makes a grammatical error. The teacher asks a question related to what the student has said, and then formulates a more complex sentence that integrates the new information. So, him lonely. What would happen if he shared his scales? Him have friends. Oh, if he shared his scales, he would have friends to play with. It's a little higher level. Okay, modeling. This is a teacher, uh, let's say a sentence, and you're stressing a very specific grammatical structure. So you have to know your student well to know what kind of errors they're making. Um, this would be an example of perhaps a child that can't use the possessive pronoun his. So to him mother, and so to his mother. So that you would pick a book, something like this, or you my mother, where there's lots and lots and lots of models of the same grammatical structure. Okay, how do you know if my child, if my student is having difficulties with word structure? There's two ways you can figure it out. An oral language sample. Write down verbatim what the student says. Uh, so don't add anything, don't take anything away, it has to be verbatim. Or the other thing is to look at a sample of their written work, because uh, that really is a window into their oral language as well. So we're gonna look at a few of these. Let's bring it together, the first three fingers. So the phonological or phonemic awareness, the vocabulary, the word structure, and the sentence structure. So here's an example from Northwood, a grade one class. This is weekend news. And looking at this, what would you say about their phonological or phonemic awareness? What would you say about their vocabulary? What do you think of their word structure? What do you think of their sentence structure? So just talk amongst yourself for a minute. And this child does not speak English at home. Okay, phonological awareness, what do you think? Yeah, pretty good, it's pretty good. What about vocabulary? Pretty good. Word structure. It's coming, coming. Word structure, we're looking for some of those, those verb, verb endings, affixes. So she's saying riding my bike. I see the beginnings of an ING there. Sentence structure. Is each, is each sentence a complete thought? More or less it is, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I did notice though with word structure, and it probably is because this little one is, doesn't speak English at home, she has a hard time knowing where one word stops and the next word starts. And anybody who's had to try to learn a second language knows that's really hard, especially if people speak quickly. So that's why she got had a lot, had a lot, is t she's broke the word, the word separated them a little bit differently. Um, her vowels are a little bit different too. So by, back instead of bike, um, that also could be ESL. You'll hear a lot of vowel deviations. Okay, how about this one? Also in grade one from Northwood. OK, 
Okay, what do you think about phonological awareness? It's coming, it's coming. Um, I see a little difficulty perhaps with some consonant blends. So the went should be NT at the end. That T is actually goes with the two. He's not real good at the spaces there. I went to, but that might be what he hears in his ear if he's a student who, doesn't, who has a different language at home where there are no consonant blends. Uh, vocabulary? Pretty good. Word structure? Not too bad. Um, I would like to see an ED with played. He's not marking verb tense yet but that would be something to be looking for and to be modeling and encouraging. Uh, sentence structure, each one looks like it's a complete thought. Uh, but also I do see a couple of articulation errors or changes. There's a T for TH, and I would want to probe a little bit to see if this child has TH in their first language. Uh, the more common English substitution is an F for a TH. So kids who speak English at home will say theater instead of theater but he might hear theater. And I see that also in the width is a T for a TH. Okay, how about this one? Here's a student of mystery. Here's this little girl's weekend news. I see and overlook went to pan, uh, went on to we a many to. I see not to went we not. I see a mees to be your so, so me. Where would you start with that? <laughs> Phonological awareness? Actually, it's developing okay. But she's also a very visual learner. She has a lot of sight words, <laughs> okay? What do you think of vocabulary? Really hard to tell. Word structure? Really hard to tell. Sentence structure? No sentence structure there yet. So this is one of our students of mystery. Okay, how about this one? This is a different task. This is from a grade two class at Northwood. And this is a little report on bats. And the dots are bullets, not periods. Okay. okay, what do you think of phonological awareness? Looks like it's all there. Vocabulary, there's lots of vocabulary. Word structure, it might be okay. Sentence structure, no. And actually what this student has done is just copied down some points from an EET chart about bats. Okay, how about this one? The phonological awareness looks pretty good. It's coming along. Vocabulary, there's some nice vocabulary in there. Word structure, I see some plurals. Uh, most verbs are uninflected, so no endings in there. And sentence structure, we see the same structure over and over again. It's a pretty simple su structure. Subject, verb, object. Okay, let's move on to text structure. Okay, what is text structure? Text structure is the organizational or structural pattern of different kinds of text. There's narrative text and there's informative text. Okay, narrative text. This is what you think of when you think of most stories. In Western culture, um, our stories follow the same consistent pattern. A setting, an initiating event or problem. Then there's a series of episodes or events then there's some sort of action to solve the problem and a consequence and then the ending. That's pretty much the way it always goes for our storybooks. So this is how Rainbow Fish unfolds. In other cultures, their stories don't necessarily follow that same story grammar. Five to seven year olds, uh, when they're telling stories, they do include an initiating event and an action sequence and then they end with a resolution. So even very young students are able to do this. Seven to nine-year-olds are even a little bit more sophisticated. They start including internal goals, motivations, and uh, the reaction of the characters. Okay? 
Now contrast that with informational text. Informational text explains things. It's more information. Lots of different structures. There's descriptions, sequence lists. And for some students, they have more difficulty understanding informational text than they do narrative text. But even very young students, some of them really like informational text. And some actually prefer it over the narrative text. And in talking with Dr. Crunwell, there's actually some sex differences. So the girls like rainbow fish. The boys want to read about sharks and wolves and dinosaurs. So there are some differences. Okay, so here's the narrative text from Rainbow Fish. And you can see where the initiating event is here. Contrast that with the informational text. So you see information versus, versus that action sequence. Okay. We really should be providing some direct instruction to help our students understand narrative text. There's a lot of links between their ability to understand, retell, and generate stories. If they understand story grammar in that sequence, then they kind of know the look for us, they can better make connections. Okay? So in explicit instruction is very helpful. And especially as you're moving from learning to read to reading to learn. Okay, you can also provide direct instruction for informational text. Again, making it visual, making it explicit, graphic organizers, Venn diagrams to sort the information out, um, and especially when used as part of a multi-strategy approach to comprehension. Okay, language comprehension and inferencing. Okay. In order to be a competent communicator, both orally and writing, Students have to be able to understand that ongoing stream of verbal and written information. They simultaneously have to be able to do all those fingers together. So the phonological awareness, so the decoding, the vocabulary, they need to know the other vocabulary as they're going along, the word structure, the sentence structure, and the text structure. All of those things have to be happening simultaneously and very quickly in order to understand the oral and written word. They also need to be able to be quickly linking new information to prior knowledge. And they also have to be able to make inferences. And some still students really have a hard time with that. So how do you make it explicit? Okay, here's a class. From, this is Miss Gibbs' class at Northwood. So she's made it very explicit, the difference between deep connections and flat connections. She's encouraging her students to actively construct mental representations as they read and listen to stories. They're continuously making inferences about what they hear and what they read. And then she's helping them integrate information. So again, here's some narrative text and some informational text. So even in kindergarten with rainbow fish, there is some inferencing that's required. So how old are the fish? Well, if they say, come and play with us, that's kind of a clue. And even the way they speak, wait for me. You should be able to come to some conclusions and make some inferencing about how old those fish are. Okay, informational text also requires some inferencing. It never ever explicitly states what the climate of Antarctica is. But if you read along, you realize that, oh, Emperor penguins live on ice shelves. That's the inferencing piece there. So inferencing is required for both kinds of text. Okay, why teach comprehension and inferencing? It's critical. It's critical, critical to development literacy and academic success. A lot of instructional time is spent listening to the teacher. And we also know that oral language supports the development of reading comprehension. So you have to be able to do it orally before you get to reading comprehension in many cases. And again, even more important as we go from learning to read to reading to learn. Okay, how do you teach comprehension and inferencing? Well, they have trouble with words and concepts, visual supports for vocabulary. In early years, and primary teachers are really good at all of these. Lots of visuals, lots of concrete things, lots of student-friendly definitions, multiple exposures and experiences, lots of review of vocabulary, 
because you want to be building that vocabulary. Okay, here's an example of a kindergarten classroom at Northwood. Many, many opportunities to learn the word measure. So we have a message on the board. We're going to measure something. We are measuring capacity, height, or weight. We measured each other with the strings here at the bottom left. We measured Mr. Shaw, and anybody who knows Mr. Shaw knows that he's about seven feet tall or close to it. He's the basketball coach. Um, we measure weight. We measured our feet. So again, that multiple, multiple experiences, authentic interactions. Okay, how do you teach comprehension and inferencing? Again, what if we have trouble with long and complex directions? Extra processing time. And that just means speaking slower. We should be speaking at about 124 to 128 words per minute for young children, for children that are five to seven. That's the speed at which Mr. Rogers speaks, or Dora speaks, in that quote. So how many of us are speaking much far, far, far faster than that? Makes it very difficult. Um, other children's programs, like the Cartoon Network, are much higher rate of speed. The children have a hard time following that, and they're actually, they're only following the story with their eyes. They're listening with their eyes and not their ears, so not as helpful. So it's really important that teachers speak slowly. Uh, breaking instructions into smaller steps, giving instructions in sequential order. So rather than say, before you do your math, I want you to do your journal, because the student is going to hear math and then journal, you want to say, do your journal, then your math for some students. Having students repeat and rephrase uh, directions so that you know that they understood it, providing them with ongoing feedback so that they know that they uh, understood, modeling think aloud strategies, all your vocabulary strategies, and all your word and sentence structure strategies. So here's some more things from Mrs. Gibbs' class. So she's again made it very explicit. We are going to use our reading strategies, and this is what they are. She's done a math problem here with her students. She's added the visuals so for, those, for those students that don't know what a box is or what hearts are. She's made it visual. She's highlighted things that are important. So she's at 30 candies and re rephrased that. That's the total. She's, she's picked out the concept word half, and she's provided a visual model of what half looks like. Okay. Okay, how do you, what if your student has trouble understanding text level materials, integrating in information and making inferences? Again, graphic organizers, make it visual, make it explicit, discuss, retell, continuing to develop that background knowledge, activating prior knowledge, direct instruction, and again, the same strategies for developing vocabulary, word and sentence structure. Okay, so here's some more very nice charts in there. What do good readers do? How do you pick a book? Reading is thinking. What are the think marks? What do think marks mean? So again, she's made it very, very explicit, very, very visual. Okay, howdy partner. Um, collaborative relationships. It's really important that you develop partnerships with your spec ed team, as well as your program team at your schools. Uh, no one person owns any student. Uh, so we all want to work together to meet our students' needs. And then lastly, I'd just like to say thank you to some of my partners over here, the Northwood table over at the front. Uh, we work a lot together, and it's thanks to them that I have all these wonderful samples of student work. So thank you. <laughs>